Good afternoon and welcome back. All right, we are on segment five. We're back to family, delivering on our promise to veterans, VA voluntary service and service to veterans. For this session, we are going to turn our attention to our core volunteer opportunities for auxiliary members to serve veterans, VA voluntary service volunteering and service to veterans. Mary Davis, our National Veterans Affairs and Rehabilitation Committee Chairman, will facilitate this session. Joining Mary is Pat Kranzow, our National Representative to the VA Volunteer Service National Advisory Committee. Mary? Thank you, Janet. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Janet has indicated there are two avenues that American Legion Auxiliary members may fulfill their personal pledge to service not self. The two nationally available avenues to volunteer are VAVS, which is through the US Department of Veterans Affairs Voluntary Service, VAVS, and our home and community-based service to veterans. During this session, you'll see on the screens, uh, we will cover what's new in VANR, VAVS, service to veterans, and Pat and I, hopefully at the end, will answer your questions and suggestions for the VAVS program and the service to volunteers program. What you see on the screen is an overview of what will be covered today. Please note also that there are note cards on your tables for questions. As we go through our briefing, if you would just write down any questions as they come to mind. I don't know about you, but periodically I think of a question and by the time I find something to write on, I've forgotten what it was. But it was important when you thought of it, write it right down right then and there. And then we'll have people come through the uh, tables to collect those. Um, <clears throat> If you have suggestions also concerning your work with the VA hospital system, uh, we would like those as well so that we can compile those at the end and see what, what answers we can come up with. All righty, so what's new? You'll see on the screen right now we have resources prepared to help all under all members understand our volunteer opportunities. We have the new uh, VANR guide for volunteers. Everybody have one of those? Okay, we'll see about that. Um, now, there's a couple of ways you can get it. The first one I got, I downloaded off our website. Very simply, every member has availability to do this. Or you may purchase it through Emblem Sales. It is so comprehensive, ladies, that it is important that every single member understand the work we do with VAVS and with volunteer to services with our veterans. Every member is a volunteer, and it is an important aspect of the volunteering and the service that we do for our, our veterans. We also have our award-winning Auxiliary Magazine, which has some great articles this month on the VA and R program. Did everybody get their Auxiliary Magazine? So now the hard question, did everybody read their Auxiliary Magazine? All right. Good. <laughs> All right. It is important. Um, and also we have the plan of action. Not only does the plan of action give you the opportunity to see the objectives that we have um, expounded a little bit on this year, but it also gives you some how-to sheets and some other ideas. And another great way of, to come up with um, ideas of things that you, uh, your unit, your department can uh, do to help veterans is to network while you're here. Network at any national organization uh, meetings. 
because that's the way you're gonna find out other things that might work in your community. If you have uh, a, an organ or a, a unit maybe that feels like they're getting a little stale with what they're doing and they're looking to do something new and innovative. So make sure you network with, with us. All right. Now let's start with the um, VA Voluntary Service Program. And Pat, if you would like to come up. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, and good afternoon, everyone. The first thing I'd like to do is introduce your VAVS Deputy Representative, Lynn Wild. Lynn, you make to stand up. <laughs> One of the things that Lynn does is oversee the process of selecting our Volunteer of the Year. And this year we had 12 outstanding candidates, so she had a big job, and thank you so much for what you do. The first item I'd like to share with you um, is about Veterans Affairs Voluntary Service, or VAVS. The Department of Veterans Affairs has adopted a new strategy for the program focused on leadership, collaboration, and impact. You need to know about this strategy because those of our members who are already engaged in VA voluntary service are probably going to be exposed to it on the local level. Sabrina Clark is the VAVS director. Some of you may know Laura Ballin, and Laura retired and Sabrina took her place. And Sabrina and the VAVS office, central office, are really pushing this new philosophy. I don't know if Sabrina brought it with her or if they've imposed it on her, but it is a good fit. Uh, we, may, we need to know about it because it's going to affect how the VAVS program operates nationally and therefore how that impacts local VAVS programs and the organizations that collaborate with the VA, such as the American Legion Auxiliary. The first component is leadership. At the NAC, or the National Advisory Committee meeting last year, we had two sectionals on leadership, on the Stephen Covey principles of leadership. Collaboration, you've heard a great deal about collaboration. You heard about it last night, and you heard about it this morning. That's all working together. The third component is impact. Impact is the so what. We have people who are trained in the VA as well as our volunteers. We're working together. And then the question is, so what? What does this do for our veterans and their health care? How do we assess what effect we have on them? And if all of this works together, then we end up with the result of a VA culture that values the strategic engagement of volunteers, community partners, and the professionals who facilitate their involvement. So this is what we're looking for, the best program that we can where our volunteers can be a part of making health care the very best it can be for our veterans and the very best support we can have for their families. Now let's turn our attention to several calls to action pertinent to the auxiliary's participation in the VA Voluntary Service Program. The American Legion Auxiliary has played a significant role in supporting the VA and the veterans that they serve for as long as the VAVS program existed. That goes back to 1946. As a member of the congressionally chartered VA Voluntary Service National Advisory Committee, or the NAC, the auxiliary plays a prominent role in VAVS operations. In the past 19 years, auxiliary affiliated volunteers have served almost 7 million hours through VAVS. The only reason that we have 19 years is because that's when they put the computer system in. So they can't tell us too much before that, but that's what's accurate right now. That's an amazing accomplishment. I'd like to take a moment to thank all the volunteers that work so tirelessly in VA centers across the country to make that happen. If you are currently serving or have served as a VAVS volunteer, would you please stand? If you have trouble standing, wave. And let's give them all a great big round of applause. Sharon, you volunteer. I 
Now, are there any representatives and deputies here who are volunteering? All right, let's give them a round of applause, too. Thank you, thank you for all that you do. Now let's look at impact. You know, we do so much, but there's always room to improve. From April 2013 to March 2014, auxiliary-affiliated volunteers have served 300,000 hours. That's a great accomplishment, but the VA can always use more volunteers, and we can do better at providing them. We really need to get the word out to all of our members and request them to consider VA voluntary service. Also remember that you don't have to be a member of the American Legion Auxiliary to serve in the VAVS. Although we should try to get as many of our members to volunteer as we can, don't be hesitant to reach outside the Legion family. There are many eager and capable volunteers in our communities and some of them might even be potential auxiliary members. The VAVS has some interesting service opportunities that will appeal to a lot of people, yet the average citizen doesn't know about them, so let's get the word out there. My best friend is someone I've known since second grade, and when she retired last year, I talked her into coming and volunteering. She's not eligible for membership, but she gives our, the auxiliary her hours. And what's maybe even better than that, she works with my mother, who is 92 and is still volunteering. Uh, my mother and I don't volunteer well together. I do patient education, and she does other things, and my friend does whatever my mother tells her to. <laughs> <laughs> of course, let's not forget our youth, both those that are part of the Legion family and those that aren't. The VAVS has a student program, and it's a great opportunity for those who want to participate. Again, the key is getting the word out. Maybe you know of someone who wants to go into one of the healthcare professions. Whether interested in the sciences or just looking to volunteer, the VAVS student program is a great opportunity. It provides excellent experience and skills. Not to mention that it fosters qualities such as leadership, dependability, and a passion for service. And when I was 15, my mother took me with her, and that's how I started. It's like our junior program. If you start early, you get really passionate about it, and you stay with it. Uh, it also looks good on a college application. There is one particular component of the student VAVS program that we'd like to highlight for you, and that's the James H. Park Memorial Scholarship. It's funded by the National Advisory Committee. Member organizations, like us, we put $2,000 a year into that program, and VA staff and volunteers. It's a great opportunity for high school volunteers who serve at least 100 hours a year. Students are nominated by VA staff, and one volunteer can be submitted from each VA center. The nominee exhibiting the best personal qualities, such as leadership, compassion, accountability, and scholastic ability, is chosen to be the national winner. Currently, that person gets a $20,000 scholarship. The winner is then awarded a scholarship to be used for college expenses. This is just one example of some of the benefits VAVS volunteers receive, and there are many. You can get free flu shots, you get a free lunch if you work for five hours, you can get invited to the awards dinner. Uh, it's really important, though, to get the youth involved. When I get the annual joint reviews from the various VAs, I notice there aren't very many youth volunteers. So that's a good area for us to work on. With all the great work the auxiliary-affiliated members are doing with the VAVS, we want to make sure we know about it, and that more important, that Congress and the American people know about it. All ALA-affiliated VAVS volunteers should be reporting their hours. It doesn't matter if they're a member or not. Occasional volunteers should remember to report their hours as well. Every hour counts. Hours should be reported to both the VAVS and to your local units. The VAVS uses an electronic reporting system for volunteers. 
uh, usually the occasional volunteers don't have access to that reporting system. So there has to be a way that they write their hours down. These are the people like who will come in for a bingo or to do something uh, occasionally, that's the key word. And they didn't have to get fingerprinted and have a background check and be an official regularly scheduled volunteer. But every one of their hours counts. And it's up to the reps to make sure that those hours are given to the chief of voluntary service and that somebody gets them in the computer because those hours are important. Lastly, we should remember that we are guests of the VA. Whoops, can we go back one? We've missed a slide. Okay. We are guests of the VA. I know a lot of us have been working for a long, long time and we want to do things our own way. However, VA changes and we need to change with it. We need to follow the rules that the VA sets as well as any rules set by your local center. Important guidelines to remember are to avoid talking about topics that will make anyone uncomfortable. Always be non-judgmental if a veteran opens up to you. Be respectful. Usually when you start to deal with a new veteran, it's Mr. Jones or Ms. Smith. It's not first name basis unless they encourage you to do that. And you need to be compassionate. You need to follow the instructions of VA staff and make sure to maintain confidentiality of everyone at the center. I think like in an elevator, I don't ever hear volunteers who are breaking confidentiality, but I do hear VA staff sometimes. So maybe we have to set the example. Of course, volunteers should always dress and behave in a manner that is professional and appropriate. They usually say no jeans, no open toe shoes. So you do what your local center asks you to do. Following the VAVS rules and guidelines is beneficial for everyone and is a part of the reason why being a VAVS volunteer is such a great experience. But I think one guiding principle that I like to mention to everyone is if you have seen one VA, you have seen one VA. Thank you. Before I get into the next topic, we have something very, uh, an announcement that's very, very special. And I would like our national president, Janet, uh, to com come up and make that announcement. Um, every year, the service organizations get to nominate one person uh, for the national award. It's, it's called NAC Award? NAC, Pat, what? The NAC Volunteer of the Year. So every year we submit someone from the American Legion Auxiliary. Well, this year, we are really honored that we have, the American Legion Auxiliary has the national winner. And that is, and that is from the Department of Illinois. I knew she, and her name is Patty w Williamson. So we are just so excited. That is such an honor, not only for Patty, but for all the wonderful VAVS volunteers that we have. And I have to tell you, I am blown away when I visit departments and VA medical centers and see and hear what all of our volunteers, and especially the VAVS reps and deps and those um, hospitals do. So thank you all for that, and congratulations to Patty. Thank you, Janet. So now we're going to turn a little bit and talk about service to veterans. So what is service to veterans? Basically, helping veterans and their families in any other setting than volunteering in a VA facility. Now remember not too long ago at a national convention, we took our home service and our field service and we combined it into this new category, service to veterans. That means that now the hours from the two other uh, areas that you had before, field service and home service, can be combined. Whether it's holding job fairs, providing goodies at nursing homes, or for homebound veterans, 
sewing, knitting, crocheting items or quilts, taking part in a stand down, and especially significant this year, shoveling snow from sidewalks, <laughs> honoring veterans on holidays or more often, helping at a homeless shelter, mowing lawns when needed. Sometimes it just may be spending time with that veteran, listening to their, what they need to, to tell you about. It might be their stories, it might be what's going on in their family, but just listening to them. Rev, uh, Reverend uh, Lavelle this morning talked about taking the veterans to their medical appointments. Now we do know that there are vans that sometimes uh, they can make, they can get their rides with the van, but sometimes they don't ask. And if we happen to be around and, and we can take them, that's a really great personal service that we can give our veterans. Since our bars for service to veterans pen can be earned by volunteering in both your home and community service, um, keep track of the value of the work you do and how many hours you spend making a difference. Hours can only be counted once, so don't report them under any other program. And helping family members does not count, so remember that. Submit your hours to your unit VANR chairman, who in turn will submit them to your department VANR chairman. Now, I have a little bit of time that I would like to ask how many people uh, have earned hours in service to veterans? Okay. How many have earned at least 50 hours? Okay, how many of those who have learned, earned at least 50 hours have the new pin? All right, how many who have at least 50 hours in service to veterans would like the new pin? Okay, first hand that went up. Let's do the very back row, that hand. Come on up. Yeah, come on down. <laughs> you can scream all the way and everything. I can't even see who it is. <laughs> yeah, I need to have you come up the stairs because if you, you're too short. If you leap like, <laughs> like Benjamin Patton did yesterday, you could get caught on this. <laughs> so I have a special surprise and I, it's exciting. And that's one thing you may want to look at for, your, for the folks in your uh, home departments is uh, letting them know that we have a new pin for service to veterans. Now, I don't have my glasses on. I want to thank you. Let's come up here just a second. I would like to thank you for serving our veterans in your home and your community. And here is the new pin. This is Terry and Christy from Vermont. Yay! These are just these are fresh off the the thing. So there we go. They may be ordered through. Uh, bring, send your hours in. Your department chairman knows to send them in, and uh, you can request your new pin. Now there's Thank a place you. on the back of that also for the hour bars to go. So you can transfer your other hour bars to, to this one. Well, Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have a bit of time reserved for <laughs> questions. Did anybody have cards that they passed to the side? Lauren's picking them up. While she picks them up, let me ask, uh, of the VAVS, do you want to come on up for this? Of the VAVS volunteers, well, let's, let's do one more thing. Let me back up just a minute. Uh, would, our, would the committee, VAV, those here from the VA and our committee, please stand to be recognized? Those who were able to make it. Thank you. Come on up. Yeah, we won't do that. So, Lauren, do we have some questions? Oh, there you are. Okay, we'll go 
proceed. A little drum roll here. Oops, there we go. Ooh, we have lots of questions. All right. I forgot to turn the thing. Okay, there's a new pin. So that's what it looks like up close and personal. So I'll read the first one. All right. See who gets to answer it. Do the unit VA and R chairs or department VA and R chairs submit the hours to national? If it is for service to veterans, the unit submits it to your department chairman who then submits it. Okay. We've got one here. Um, changes are hard, especially for longtime volunteers. Do you have any suggestions, especially about how to gently remove or retire from service a volunteer who is no longer capable of doing the job? There are so many jobs that they can do, and there are different ways that they can do those jobs. Sometimes it takes some creativity between the rep and the chief of voluntary service, unless the problem is the rep. And unfortunately, sometimes I do get calls and try to mediate. And usually people will feel good afterwards if we handle it gently. I don't think I can answer a specific instance, but if there is something that you want to talk about, maybe we can give you some strategies, but not in the whole public forum. I have one for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tips to encourage members to volunteer at VAMC. Here, I'll let you read it before you answer. <laughs> We had a tea recently to try to get some new members, and the chief from our local VA came and spoke. And everybody was really excited about trying to find ways to get there. Uh, I think if you can work with occasional programs first, then they get the, the bite that they really want to continue doing it. That may be the way to do it. Sometimes the process of becoming a regularly scheduled volunteer gets in the way. It takes a long time to get fingerprinted, and as they told me, I have old skin or something, so I have a problem every time they fingerprint. But there are computer things you can do. There is virtual volunteering that you can do from your home, depending on what, you, what your relationship is with the chief. So there are lots and lots of opportunities. All right, I still don't understand the new service to veterans pin. What hours does it mean? So anytime you do, say, sewing in your home or baking in your home, um, what used to be home service counts. Also, anytime you, say, drive a veteran to their uh, medical appointment or maybe you go grocery shopping for them and bring it back, those would count on service to veterans. Remember what I said about every member, every member is a volunteer, every member should have the new guide? Because in that new guide, it gives you some more ideas of things that you can do. But any way that you serve a veteran that is not within the hospital setting, the VA hospital setting, that is service to veterans. And sometimes you spend your own money for supplies. Keep track of the dollars you spend. Keep track of the hours you spend putting something together, um, purchasing the, the goods to put together, or taking time out to just sit and chat with a veteran. Those are all hours that you can include. How can we work with the VA hospitals to give our volunteers more storage room instead of taking their storage space away? First of all, we're a guest. It's the VA's storage space, and they're kind enough to let us have some of it. Um, there is a move in some hospitals now, or VA medical centers, where they're sharing everything. So it's there amongst all the VSOs. You may bring in things and get credit for it, but if you lock it in your cabinet and a veteran needs it when you're not there, it doesn't help anybody. So there's a move to be more sharing and more having things available, because after all, what impact do we have and what is our result? It's the best that we can do for our veterans. Not that we've got our name on it and this cabinet belongs to the ALA. 
So try to change with whatever the policy is at the hospital. And I know they'll work with you the best they can, and they'll probably apologize for taking your space away, but they may be using that space for something else. Like I know at Jesse Brown right now, they're, they have a space so that the veterans can come in and talk to um, Social Security. So by limiting your space, they may be providing more services. So don't hold on. <laughs> See, that's when we love what we do so much, it's hard <laughs> to let go. What avenues can you follow to resolve issues with the hospital administrator who is less than cooperative? Um, I don't know what you mean by administrator, if you mean the chief of voluntary services or if you mean the actual director of the hospital. Uh, I have had some conference calls where both are involved. Uh, I usually try to write a nice letter or a nice email if a representative has contacted me and said there is a problem. I know in Hawaii, the ladies were not getting credit for their hours for years and years and years. And we finally got them certified, and they're now getting hours. So sometimes it takes a while. Um, I'm the troubleshooter whenever I can. But it doesn't mean that you're going to get your way <laughs> just because it's the way you've always done it. I'm going back to we are guests. And the end result is the best possible care and service to veterans. So I, the last question I have is how much does a new pin cost? And I would recommend that you go on to Emblem Sales because they will have the, no. Yes, go on to Emblem Sales that they will have the cost of the pin there, no. Okay, they are, they're frantically trying to get their phones to look it up, because I don't know right off the top of my head, it is so new. Are there any questions that were not submitted to us that you still have about VABS, VANR, volunteers? Feel free to come to the mic. Uh, come find us later. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Which one's the next one? Okay. Eight minutes. Okay. Yes. I have been spending many, many hours crocheting these little poppies that I'm wearing. Okay. And I sell them to earn money for a saw for the VA home. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if I can use those hours. Mm -hmm. I can. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Marie, do you have a question? Is that you? It's really hard to see. I thought people were crazy when they said they couldn't see everybody out there, but you get past a first certain point, you can't. Good. We know now that we can do whatever we want. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we can sleep and, you know. <laughs> My question, if you bake or cook or whatever, mm -hmm. for a, a function in your home, but it's a veteran and non-veteran attending, can your hours count because there are some veterans there? Well, the thing is, what is it a dinner you're having in your home for veterans? Yeah. Okay, so as, not a, as opposed to your unit coming in and baking some things that they're going to give like to the veterans home. You in fact are doing something in your home to um, honor a veteran that is not a family member. Well, it'd be like a veterans dinner, but they're, Spouses if are you're, not veterans. If you're supplying the food and the time it took to cook it for a veteran that is not a family member, you may count it. Thank you. Thank you. So now, do we have some best practices that I might be able to encourage some of you to come up and tell us a little bit about? If not, I'll start with one, and I'll expect the rest of you to stand up and give me some. So. <laughs> So not too many years ago, I found um, in, the, in the fabric store, which I happen to be in constantly, um, for my collection, you know. Anyway, I found some great patriotic fabric, and so I decided I would make some lap robes, only larger lap robes, because sometimes 
some of us tend to be a little bit larger than the normal lap robe size. So they're a little bit larger lap robe. And, but I wanted to do something a little different so they knew about us. And we used to have those little labels that you could put on things that says American Legion Auxiliary. But I have an embroidery machine, so I designed uh, a label that I actually put on the fabric um, that said, uh, honoring your service, the American Legion Auxiliary. So that every time they use that lap robe, that they knew who it came from. So now I would like to hear of what you all are, have done. There were an awful lot of hands that said that they had uh, 50 hours or more. What are some of the things that you do? I knew you'd get up. Thank you. Brenda Toppin, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, we are across the state and my unit locally are doing the match for the homeless and we're making them out of grocery bags and we're crocheting them. But the good thing that it's kind of twofold because locally we meet once a week and so people in the auxiliary and some of the people that are not in the auxiliary come to help and so we, it gives us time to communicate and be able to get to know each other more and then we take our mats um, to the four VA hospitals in North Carolina that they use for stand downs and they are just mats that they can put underneath their sleeping bag that sort of prevents the moisture from wicking through. So that's what we're doing. Let me ask you, how big are your mats? What size are they, do you know? They are 36 by 72. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. This is called networking, ladies. I'm giving you some new ideas here. Go ahead. Uh, Donna Ray from the Department of Ohio. Uh, I'm very honored to be a part of the VABS. Our chief, uh, Tracy Butts, which has just, she's phenomenal. Um, got me involved in the VABS. I used to do the bingos and the coffee and donuts, and now I work real closely with um, Tracy and got humswoggled into being the <laughs> chairman of their holiday committee. In other words, Donna, we need money. Okay. And we work with a lot of other uh, organizations. But what we're really excited about this next two years they have put in for the wheelchair uh, races in Cincinnati and we just had the salute to veterans which I volunteer once a week on Wednesday but now I'm working five days whenever she needs me and it was just wonderful and we have a veteran I have to throw this out he's nine he'll be 94 years old July 14th, he has been volunteering, he's a veteran, he's been volunteering at the VA for 57 years and has never missed a day. And he's just now starting to walk with a cane and they asked me if I could, because he lives close to me, within about 15 miles or so. So every Wednesday, when we get off of our volunteering on Wednesday, I put him in my car and we travel to his house, and he is just, that's what it's all about. So Donna, are you counting the hours that you? Absolutely, I clock in every time I'm there. But, but the ones that you transport him? Oh yes. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh. He's, he's my love. <laughs> Thank you. Carol Edwards from the Department of South Dakota. One of the things in our Sioux Falls unit is by the Sioux Falls VA, and they are making, um, they're taking blue jeans and cutting the legs off of the blue jeans, and then they sew the bottoms of them up, and then that way the veterans are able to attach the upper part of the blue jeans to their walkers and wheelchairs oh. to hang on to their cell phones and whatever else that they can't use with their hands, rather than having those lady-looking bags attached the guys actually, or the veterans, actually have a pair of blue jeans attached to their walkers, and they're really enjoying those. Thank you. We have time for two more. Debbie Swafford, Department of Utah. Uh, last year, our unit wanted to do something, so we got our community involved. They donated yarn, and we had ladies in the community crochet and knit lap afghans. We were pleased to be able to open two new veterans' homes last year. So we wanted to make sure each of the homes had the lap afghans. We not only 
were able to provide 108 lap afghans to those homes. We provided them to the Ogden home, this uh, one in Salt Lake, which is Bill Christofferson. We did one in Grand Junction. And we are now making uh, the knit caps with the little loom thing because so many of our troops that are coming back now are okay. females and they're having babies and the VA does not have uh, a stock for the VA, the lady veterans. Okay. So we're, we're providing those for the veterans. Thank you so much. One more. Thank you, Anne Rabine, Department of Iowa. Uh, our whole department is involved in this project and we are making Quilts of Valor. And we have discovered that it is just a tremendous project that anybody can work on. You don't have to know how to sew. If you don't know, if you can't sew, you can press. If you can't press, you can, you know, you can do anything. You can fix lunch, whatever. Anyway, it started out with one day we had 25 people. And now it's gone out to the districts and the counties. And we just had a quilting 101 at our midwinter conference. So we have 12 brand new quilters. Great. So it is just growing by leaps and bounds. So thank you, that's Anne. That's what we're doing. And, <laughs> and thank you all for sharing. Appreciate it. Oops. That's it. Uh, the service to veterans pin must be ordered by the department secretary from Emblem Sales. So must be ordered by the department secretary. Uh, the price is approximately $15. Uh, it's an award not just a pin, you, you have to earn it, okay? Not, Thank you. Right, not just anybody. That's, that's why it has to go through your department secretary so she can verify the hours that you've earned. Thank you all so much. For our next session, we're back to family again, caring for caregivers, the need and the response. And presenting that section will be our national vice president, Sharon Kanat. Good afternoon. I'm so pleased to introduce our next session, caring for caregivers, the need and the response. As you will learn from our presenters this afternoon, and the remarks from our National Veterans Affairs and Rehabilitation Chairman, Mary Davis, the American Legion Auxiliary is planting a stake in the ground when it comes to military and veteran caregiver support. Those of you who attended last year's Washington, D.C. conference where we call that we held a session on caregiver support that featured Kevin Pulaski, who provided simultaneous heartbreaking and hopeful testimony about his experience as a caregiver to his wife, U.S. veteran Christina. Kevin joined us as a representative of the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, which the Senator formed as a national call to action to support our nation's military and veteran caregivers. I'm pleased to report that just after the DC conference, the Elizabeth Dole Foundation asked the American Legion Auxiliary to join their efforts as a collaborator and moreover to make a specific pledge, and we have. The Auxiliary's national leadership comprised at the time of then National President Nancy Brown Park then National Vice President Janet Jefford, and myself in the role as National Veterans Affairs and Rehabilitation Chairman, said, absolutely, this is a natural fit for our American Legion Auxiliary, and how could we respond with anything other than yes? So today we are going to dive deep into the subject area of military and veteran caregiver support. We have assembled an esteemed group of experts to share their knowledge and resources with us. Our first presenter is Terry Tannelin, Senior Social Research Analyst at the RAND Corporation. Her areas of interest include military and veterans health policy, military suicide, military sexual assault, psychological and behavioral effects of combat terrorism and disasters, public health emergency preparedness, and risk communication. As the former director of the RAND Center for Military Health Policy Research, Terry spent a decade overseeing RAND's divorce diverse military health research. She was the co-study director for an assessment of the psychological, emotional, and cognitive consequences of deployment to Iraq and Afghanistan. 
entitled Invisible Wounds of War, Psychological and Cognitive Injuries, Their Consequences and Services to Assist Recovery. Terry was also the co-director of Rand's study, Hidden Heroes, America's Military Care Caregivers, the first representative study of military caregiving in the United States. Following her will be Meg Cabot, Acting National Director of the Caregiver Support Program of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Meg has worked with many populations, including the elderly, those struggling with mental illness, and adopted children. She has worked in many different roles, both for the Navy and the Department of Veterans Affairs. Megan began working in, with the Department of Veterans Affairs Caregiver Support Program in 2011, and currently she serves as the Principal Advisor on Caregiver Support Program Matters. She is responsible for national oversight and implementation of the Caregiver Support Program. Meg serves as the Principal Manager to develop a program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers and a program for general caregiver support services. She is responsible for critic critical national policy development and program oversight. She promotes the role of the family caregiver in the multiple committees and work groups, both within and outside the VA. Please welcome Terry to our stage. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and to talk to you a little bit about military caregiving. I'm just going to make sure that I've got this um, lined up correctly. So excuse me. Again, um, my name is Terry Tenillion. I'm from the RAND Corporation. And I'm really happy to be here with you today to talk to you about the results of our study, Hidden Heroes, America's Military Caregivers. Um, this study was funded by the Elizabeth Dole Foundation and represents a two-year effort to understand the size and scope of military caregiving in the United States. The study was primarily motivated with an idea of trying to understand who was really caring for our disabled veterans. With 22 million veterans living in the United States today, we know that the number of those living with service-connected disabilities is on the rise. We wanted to understand more about who were the individuals that were providing care and assistance for this important population in the United States. We also wanted to know a little bit about the toll that caregiving took on these individuals, particularly the physical, emotional, and financial aspects and the burdens associated with military caregiving. We wanted to also understand then what resources were available to mitigate these consequences and to support caregivers in fulfilling their roles and supporting our nation's veterans. We wanted to understand if there were any gaps that could benefit from improved uh, financing or improved policy recommendations that could really serve to better support our military caregivers. So to undertake this study, which I mentioned was a two-year effort, we conducted two different phases of our research. The second phase, which I'm going to talk about today, included a national survey of caregiving in the United States, as well as a comprehensive environmental scan of available policies, programs, and resources to support caregivers. Our national survey of caregiving was the largest study of caregiving ever conducted in the United States. We reached out to over 40,000 households across the United States to understand whether or not there were any adults living in that household who were providing care and assistance for an adult, another adult over the age of 18, who suffered from a disabling illness, injury, or wound. We then under, sought to understand who they were providing this care and assistance for to determine whether or not that individual ever served in the armed forces. Our resulting sample yielded the largest um, sample of military caregiving ever conducted. Based upon this survey, we can generalize results and come up with estimates of the size of the military caregiving population in the United States. We know that 9% of US adults are caregivers to someone other than themselves. They are 22, billion, or 22 million individuals living in the United States today. Of this 22 million, 5.5 million individuals are providing care and assistance to someone who formerly served in the armed services. Of this 5.5, 20% or 1.1 million individuals are providing that care and assistance for someone who served post 9-11 um, in support of the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm going to first talk a little bit about these, um, who are these caregivers, what are, what are they look like. And to do this analysis, we looked at the caregivers in three different discrete groups. We first understood who are civilian caregivers, that is individuals providing care and assistance for another adult who never served in the armed forces. We then looked at the population of individuals who were providing care and assistance for individuals who served pre-9-11. 
And then we looked at those who were providing care and assistance for um, individuals who served post 9-11. And we separated those groups for some important reasons. The first is largely driven by the nature that they're eligible for different types of programs and services based upon some recent legislation to support military caregivers. So we wanted to understand the distinctions between these groups. And what we found is that the post-9-11 caregiving population differs in important ways from pre-9-11 caregivers as well as civilian caregivers. They're younger, 37% of them are under the age of 30. They're more likely to be this, a spouse, friend, or a parent of the individual that they're caring for. 33% of post-9-11 caregivers are spouses, 25% are friends, and about 23% are the parents of the individual that they're providing care for. This is in comparison to pre-9-11 and civilian caregivers who are most likely to be a child of an aging parent, if you will. They're also less likely to have a support network, and by here we mean support network of other individuals that can provide caregiving um, substitution. 53% of them indicated that they had no one else that they could rely upon to come in and provide those same caregiving duties for their loved one. They were also more likely to be employed. 63% were at least, or employed at least part-time, so they're in the labor force. What are they doing? So again, we look at the three different groups and try to understand the types of support and activities that they were providing for their, care, uh, their loved ones, the care recipients. These post-9-11 care recipients, um, we found important difference be the differences between the post-9-11 population as well as the pre-9-11 population. The post-9-11 care recipients are more likely to have a behavioral health problem. 64% of them um, indicated that they had a behavioral health problem, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. We find post-9-11 care recipients have twice the rate of traumatic brain injury as compared to the pre-9-11 and civilian care recipient populations who are more likely to be dealing with chronic conditions or neurological conditions such as those associated with aging, um, such as dementia or Alzheimer's. We also found that the post-9-11 care recipients were much more likely to have a, a service-connected disability rating from the VA. Here you can see that about twice um, as many, 60% had a po uh, of the post-9-11 care recipients had a VA service-connected rating. Again, their duties um, differed somewhat, but not as dramatically as the characteristics of the populations. We find that about 44% uh, of post-9-11 uh, caregivers are providing assistance with activities of daily living. These are things like feeding, bathing, dressing. We find that about 80% to 96% of caregivers are providing help with at least one instrumental activity of daily living. These are things like providing transportation, taking care of the house, financial responsibilities, et cetera. But we do find striking differences when we look at the um, support provided for individuals who have behavioral health problems. We see 75% of post-9-11 caregivers are helping their care recipients deal with stressful situations. This may be things like avoiding the triggers associated with post-traumatic stress disorder. When you tally up the time that our caregivers spend, we know that it uh, provides a benefit to society in terms of savings. And so among our post-9-11 caregivers, they're providing an annual uh, savings of about $3 billion um, to our American society. This is if we were to have to pay to replace these caregivers with home health aides. So $55 billion total caregiving saves the United States today. But we know that uh, caregiving also comes with some uh, burdens and consequences for the caregivers themselves. One of the most striking consequences that we observed was the rates of depression. We find that post-9-11 caregivers were at four times the risk of depression as compared to the general civilian population. Again, uh, caregivers of the pre-9-11 generation as well as civilian caregivers um, experienced about two times the rate of depression as the general population. When we sought to understand what the risk factors for this um, rate of depression were, we found that a number of factors contrib contributed to um, elevated risk of depression. The most significant uh, risk factors were the time spent caregiving and helping the care recipient cope with stressful situations. So if you think about for every hour spent caregiving, it increases the risk that the caregiver will experience uh, depression. 
when we looked at trying to understand whether or not these caregivers with depression were getting help, we found that only about a third of them were getting some type of mental health counseling for their problems. When we looked to understand what gaps may exist and why they're not getting the help they need, we found that about a third of the post-9-11 caregivers didn't have any health insurance, and about 28% reported that they didn't have a regular source of care. We also heard from our caregivers that they often tend to minimize their own health concerns, so they tend to themselves um, last and uh, will kind of minimize their own health concerns and not seek out to get the help that they may need. Again, we know that caregiving results in work-related adjustments. I mentioned um, that about 63% were employed at least uh, part-time. We know that of those in the labor force, about half had to make some kind of work-related adjustments. This may include reducing their hours per week or leaving the workforce altogether. And again, this is at a higher rate than we see among pre-9-11 and civilian caregivers. These work-related adjustments come at a cost to our employers, so it's associated with lost productivity. We found that post-9-11 caregivers, on average, missed about 4.4 days per month of work. This costs our employers and society about $6 billion per year in lost productivity, indicating that this is a huge economic toll for our society as well. What resources are available to support our caregivers to try to mitigate some of these uh, risks and consequences that I just talked about? We looked to create an, a comprehensive environmental scan of all programs, policies, and support resources that were available for military caregivers. We looked to the web. We went through every entry in the National Resource Directory. We consulted with experts. We attended multiple meetings. And at the end of every interview, we asked individuals if they knew of something else. We started with a list of about 500 organizations. By the time we sought to understand a little bit more about what they were doing, we were down to 120 organizations that were providing about 211 distinct um, types of support programs to address the needs of military caregivers, some of them directly, some of them incidentally. These programs could be uh, broken down into four different types. Those programs that are essentially available to help the caregivers provide better care, these come in the form of providing education and training or patient advocacy and case management to facilitate their way through the healthcare system. Those programs that were designed to promote caregiver well-being, so things that tend to the caregiver's own emotional and psychological support needs, such as social support programs, helping hand uh, services, which could be providing anything from assistance mowing the lawn to temporary financial um, loan relief to kind of help pay the bills to babysitting services. Wellness activities could include retreats or yoga classes, um, as well as some of those that were providing religious and spiritual support. We found a number of programs that are providing uh, support to the caregivers' families. So this may be the um, children or other uh, siblings or family members that could benefit from some of these helping hand services or wellness activities as well. And the last category of support programs were those that were designed to compensate for income loss. So as I mentioned, we know that many have to leave the workforce, and this can result in an increased financial burden and income loss. There are three programs that were designed to provide a monthly stipend to caregivers um, in response for their uh, caregiving duties. Uh, one of these is run by the Department of Veterans Affairs, which you'll hear about a little bit later today, one by the Department of Defense, and another one by a nonprofit organization that provides monthly stipends to uh, caregivers. Of these 120 organizations, a couple of findings were particularly striking. The first is that 80% of them um, operate from the nonprofit sector. What, what, we also, what we also learned was that when we asked the caregivers the types of programs that they used, we found underutilization across all categories. And so while 120 programs were available um, for caregivers, we asked the caregivers what they were using, and we find that none of these programs were used by more than 30, none of these types of programs were used by more than 30% of caregivers. And the one that was most frequently endorsed among post-9-11 caregivers was the religious and spiritual support programs. 
We also tried to understand to the extent that we could overlay the needs with the types of programs that were offered, where were the gaps in the services. And what we found is that most of the programs that said they offered services for military caregivers were really designed primarily to address the veteran's need, not the caregiver's. They may include the caregiver incidentally because they include the family of the veteran in the types of programs and services that they make available, which leads to the fact that oftentimes these programs are not tailored to the caregiver's needs, they're tailored to the veteran's needs. We also found that a number of the programs, particularly those available at the state level, really restricted the eligibility to, the, um, to based upon the age of the care recipient. So they had to be an older beneficiary, for example, 60 um, years or older, um, and often leaving our post-9-11 caregivers and their care recipients without access to some of these programs and services. And many of them required that the caregiver be a first degree relative of the care recipient. Again, excluding some of those friends that I mentioned earlier who make up 25% of the post on 11 caregiving population. Again, we wanted to look to the future to try to understand what could we expect of the trajectory of military caregiving over time and what are the needs particularly of the post on 11 generation of caregivers. And we found a few threats that we need to be a little bit worried about in terms of the caregiving continuity for our post-9-11 veterans. The first was associated with the parents that I mentioned. So about 23% of military caregivers for post-9-11 veterans are parents who will age. Uh, we modeled that in just 15 years, the overwhelming majority of our parent caregivers will reach an age where they are likely to require caregiving themselves meaning that they will not only need to find their own caregiver, but they may need to find a caregiving substitute for their post-911 um, child who requires caregiving support. We also found that young relationships um, bring uh, some vulnerability associated with them. Among our post-911 caregiving population who were spouses, they reported significantly lower marital uh, satisfaction than did our pre-911 uh, married caregivers. And we know that many of them have been married for less than 10 years. These are fragile, vulnerable marriages, and the stress of caregiving may contribute to higher risks of divorce. Again, as these individuals divorce, our post-9-11 veterans may be at risk for needing um, caregiving substitutes if their spouses are no longer available. With respect to the program landscape, I mentioned that 80% of them operate in the nonprofit sector, meaning that they're dependent upon external sources of support to maintain their viability. Um, many of them are less than 10 years old. Over half of the programs that we identified had been in existence for 10 years or less. They are using novel approaches that lack any um, evidence of effectiveness, potentially calling into concern whether or not they'll be able to maintain their financial support and uh, threaten their sustainability in this landscape. So based upon our findings, we outline uh, a series of recommendations that really are designed to create a better uh, pa path of support. And I've just lost, oh, here we go, the slide. Um, the first is really to empower caregivers, to really strengthen their ability to uh, provide the care for their care recipient. This comes in the form of providing high quality training and education, not just one-stop shopping, but the need to make sure that the um, training support is dynamic and changes with the needs of the caregiver as their own knowledge and competencies change, but as the care recipient's need for caregiving, caregiving assistance also changes over time. We need to ensure that they have health care coverage and structured support to facilitate better health. Um, remember, you know, some of the big concerns around only having limited uh, uh, substitution for their caregiving support can leave them feeling often isolated, and so that need for um, social support is really critically important for reducing their stress. We also need to raise awareness to match caregivers uh, with services. One of the things that we found striking is that caregivers often don't identify themselves. And so we, um, if you were to ask individuals if they were caregivers, many fewer people will raise their hand than if you ask them if they provide the certain caregiving functions. And so we need to raise awareness so that people understand that they may benefit from the types of programs and services that are available for caregivers. Again, one of the interesting findings that we found is that 40% of all caregivers across the different groups are men men are much less likely to raise their hand if you ask them if they're caregivers, but they are a substantial portion of the population. And so we need to make sure that they know the support is available to them as well. The second 
area of recommendations is really about creating caregiver-friendly environments. And this, we focused on two areas. The first is in the workplace. As I mentioned, about 75% of military caregivers of the post-9-11 generation are in the labor force. We need to ensure that their workplaces provide supportive environments. Studies have shown that providing programs such as employee assistance resources, nurse care managers, um, and 24-hour call lines can reduce lost productivity. So there's a business case to be made for those employers to provide supportive workplace environments um, for military caregivers. And in healthcare settings also, we know that caregivers are an important component of the healthcare team. They are often responsible for interacting with healthcare professionals. They are the ones that make sure treatment regimens are followed and adhered to. And so they need to be respected and incorporated into the healthcare setting as well so that healthcare professionals can include them in those conversations, but also tend to their needs as they may arise in that setting. The third area of recommendations is around filling the gaps in programs and services. And as I mentioned, there's a need to really realign the eligibility criteria for some of these programs so that we can ensure that the full spectrum of post-9-11 uh, caregivers can have access to the benefits and programs so that they're not necessarily restricted just based upon age of the care recipient or that they're um, based upon the familial, familial relationship. We also need to expand respite care. One finding that was in my previous slide that I didn't mention is that only nine programs um, pro indicated that they provided respite care for military caregivers. And I mentioned that time spent caregiving is the most significant predictor for depression among caregivers. So caregivers need a break. So we need to ensure that more respite services and care is available for these individuals, but it may require some creativity because making sure that an individual who's tending to the needs of someone with a behavioral health problem is very different than making sure that um, someone who's tending to a physical health problem gets respite. Is di it may require different training for those respite care providers, and so we need to get creative and think about how we can expand and deliver these respite care services to these caregivers. And the final area of a recommendation is really about thinking for the future. And so while our study is a single point in time, I mentioned that aging parents and vulnerable marriages may require um, us to think about caregiving continuity for this population. That is going to require thinking about legal and financial planning, not just at the individual family level, but also as a society. If we cannot provide caregiving um, substitutes and continuity for this generation of veterans, where, how are they going to be cared for? Are they going to be able to stay in their homes, or are they going to need to be in institutions? So we need to think strategically both at the family level as well as at the society level for how we address their needs over the long term. Sustainability of programs is a large theme and issue um, in the nonprofit sector in particular. There's been increasing concerns about the potential decrease in the amount of philanthropic support to support our veterans in time as it no longer is on the front page of the newspaper every day. And so we need to think about how many of these programs are going to be available in this landscape long term and what we can do to ensure their continuity. We also need to think about the quality of the services provided. I mentioned that many of these programs are providing services that have never been evaluated. And so we don't know to what extent they're working and to what extent they're providing value. And we need to ensure that we're doing evaluations rigorously so that we can determine that when we're investing in these programs that we know that the caregivers are getting some benefit. And so finally, that means we need to think about uh, more research, not only in evaluating these programs, but following the needs of our caregiving population over time. We expect that our post-9-11 vet, uh, veteran caregivers will be providing this level of support for many years to come, decades to come. And we know that their burdens as well as their needs will likely change over time. And if the landscape shifts, we need to be aware of keeping track of those gaps in services as well. And so we'll need to continue to do that research. And that takes me to the end, and thank you very much. Thank you, Terry, for providing the framework for considering military and veteran caregiver support needs. Now let's hear from Meg, who will provide an overview of the VA's caregiver support services. Meg? Good afternoon. Um, my name is Meg Cabot, and I'm the Acting National Director of the Department of Veterans Affairs Caregiver Support Program. Um, I'm curious how many of you knew that the VA has a caregiver support program? Okay, not enough of you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and I also would like to know how many of you actually take care of a veteran? 
providing, and when, you know, Terry talks a little bit about the difficulty about people identifying themselves as caregivers, so what I mean is that you're doing something for someone that you care about that they used to be able to do for themselves. Okay, great. Well, thank you all very much for everything that you do to take care of our veterans. You're an incredibly important part of um, what VA is doing right now in trying to get veterans to a place where they can be as independent as they can uh, with our younger folks and, and helping our older veterans to age well and stay at home uh, in, a, in a healthy and happy environment. So I'm gonna go through this. <clears throat> Let's see, do I just push the green button? Okay, okay, so very briefly, um, VA, the, our caregiver support program, our mission is to promote the health and well-being of family caregivers who care for our nation's veterans through education, resources, support, and services. This is over the past few, few years, about four years at this point, has been somewhat earth-shattering within the VA culture because as you know, um, we talk a lot about the VA being about the veteran and taking care of the veteran. But um, over the past several years, through a variety of different programs, we've worked hard to really also provide support to that caregiver. And passage of some legislation in 2010 allowed VA to take that caregiver and sort of move them next to the veteran. In the past, they've had to sort of get care and support through the veteran, but now we can actually provide them support directly. So our goals are really to allow our most vulnerable veterans to remain at home, to address the specific needs of family caregivers, <clears throat> to promote the health and well-being of both the veteran and the caregiver, and to reduce isolation. Terry talked a lot about isolation, and we, this is a, something that's very important to us, and to, to sensitize healthcare providers to the role of the family caregiver. And that goes along with what Terry was just talking about in terms of making healthcare environments caregiver friendly. So we have a full menu of services. Many of these things on this menu have been around for a long time and support caregivers in their work that they're doing with veterans in the community. So things like in-home care, skilled care, respite care, these are things that are available to veterans enrolled in VA healthcare that may not be available to um, to other folks who may also need these services, but VA is able to provide these services. We've been able to expand what we're doing, <coughs> excuse me, through our website and the caregiver support line. I'm gonna talk about some of these things a little bit more in depth. We also have placed a caregiver support coordinator at all of our medical centers, so that there's someone in each medical center who is really the eyes and ears of caregivers and is looking at th things through that lens and is participating in treatment team meetings and talking about things like respite care, promoting respite care, celebrating National Family Caregivers Month in November, doing those kinds of things and talking about caregivers to help educate the veterans and their caregivers as well as the staff within that medical center. And I'm gonna talk about some of these other things a little bit more in depth. So, we need to make sure that our caregivers know that we have these resources available. So we do that in two main ways, through our caregiver support line. And actually this number, I had to prepare these slides a few weeks ago. So today I learned that we actually are up to 171,000 calls. When we set up that call center, we imagined that that would be a place where post 9-11 caregivers would call to learn about some of the newer services and supports. And we were wrong. It's actually um, the calls that we get to that call center actually really echo the uh, veterans who are um, receiving services through VA. So most of the calls are from caregivers of veterans from Vietnam and Korea, followed by World War II and then on to our post 9-11. Uh, we continue to get about 200 calls per day. The average calls actually increase a little bit every year. They have over the four years that we've been uh, operating the support line. We also have a website which is very active, has some videos as well as some tips and tools to help caregivers stay organized. So I encourage you to take a look at that website. It's actually one of the more visited websites within the VA suite of websites, so we're proud of the work that we've done there. 
One of the things that we want to do is expand support and services, and we really want to take a look at quality. And Terry talked about this being an important thing. So we are trying to identify best practices as well as evidence-based practices, meaning things that have um, support, evidence behind them, scientific merit. And so we've done, we're doing a lot of different things. We have a lot of different education and training programs. We have calls that are offered that are run by the social workers at our support line. We have self-care courses, which are in-person classes. They're about three hours in length. Has anyone ever attended one of those classes? No, okay. Um, they're uh, actually done by, um, through uh, a partnership that we have with Easter Seals. They're done at the VA Medical Center or a site close by. And it's about three hours on various topics, including self-care, how to communicate with your health care provider, uh, all those different kinds of things that are really key for caregivers as they continue their journey. We have uh, done some very specific topic-specific trainings. We used our satellite TV system and had subject matter experts in our TV studio here in D.C. broadcasting live to medical centers across the country. This year we've taken it uh, to the next level and we've actually done some live webinars. One uh, most recently on domestic violence when you're in a caregiving relationship with someone and there's also potentially domestic violence going on. Uh, and then uh, even more recently than that, we did one about PTSD and the impact that PTSD has on an entire family. Uh, and that was viewed by more than 600 caregivers live and then many more caregivers have watched that on demand. Uh, resources for enhancing all caregivers' health is a specific intervention that has a lot of evidence behind it. A lot of research been, has been done. Uh, and it, this is for um, uh, caregivers of veterans with dementia. There's also a version uh, for use with spinal cord injury. And we are currently working on versions for uh, MS, ALS, and PTSD. This is a very intense, individualized kind of program in which the caregiver and the, the clinician work closely around identifying difficult behaviors, things that they wish were different in their caregiving duties and figuring out how to make things better for them and in their home and for the veteran, ultimately. Uh, we also offer a lot of different kinds of peer support. We do that through our um, telephone support, which is, a, again, an evidence-based group in which caregivers are getting together. There is a clinician with them, so they are uh, talking back and forth and supporting one another. We have an online program called Building Better Caregivers, which is um, workshops with about 20 caregivers. They do a lot of problem solving and are supporting one another. There are moderators on that workshop, but they are all caregivers themselves. Compassionate Connections is something that we've recently started in which a, a caregiver can speak directly to another caregiver, and we link those folks together, and they can talk maybe just once or twice, usually via telephone. And then the longer-term version of that is our peer support mentoring program in which we're matching caregivers uh, who are comfortable in their caregiving role and have been doing this a while with caregivers who may be new to the role and struggling a bit. And all of those programs that I've talked about so far are open to caregivers of veterans of all eras. Um, the next thing I'll move into is the program of comprehensive assistance, which is our post 9-11 program. And that program is specifically was established under public law 111-163 and has allowed VA to really provide an unprecedented level of service to caregivers of veterans who were injured uh, post 9-11. So it's a clinical program. It's not part of the benefit package. It's part of the health care package. And um, it provides the additional services and supports to family caregivers of eligible veterans who are injured in the line of duty. These include a stipend that's paid directly to the caregiver, enrollment in CHAMP VA, which is VA's version of health insurance for non-veterans if that caregiver doesn't have access to other health insurance, mental health treatment, beneficiary travel, meaning that they can be reimbursed for travel if they're accompanying a veteran or if they're going to visit a veteran who may be receiving treatment, education and training, and additional respite services. 
What makes this a clinical program is that program must be in the clinical best interest of the veteran and it must support that veteran's progress in treatment. So really we're talking about an intervention. This is part of the veteran's treatment plan to be uh, in the program of comprehensive assistance. So some of the additional eligibility criteria uh, when we talk about injury, the way that injury is defined in the law is that this includes traumatic brain injury, psychological trauma, such as PTSD, or other mental disorders. It does not include illness, and um, this is something that uh, is a frequent discussion with VA and, and folks on the Hill about expanding the language in the law to include illness. Currently, VA cannot do that under this particular statute. And this is really meant to be a long-term program. It's meant to be for a veteran who requires this level of assistance for more than six months. So many of us require assistance from someone else when we're recovering from a surgery or after an accident or an injury. But really, this is meant to be for those service members or veterans who require this care for more than six months. I already talked about some of these other pieces. So just to get a feel for where VA is at in terms of this program, <clears throat> we currently have uh, more than 19,000 folks participating. The, the program is tiered based on the needs of the, the veteran. And so at the tier three, the veteran ha has been identified to have the most needs. And that caregiver receives a stipend about $2,200 a month, and then it goes on from there. Um, you'll see our health care coverage enrollees. We have about 4,800 caregivers who did not have health insurance who now do. And so the rest of those folks already had some kind of health care insurance through um, TRICARE or Medicare or through an employer. And you can see our caregiver demographics. They're a little bit different than what Terry described, even with this post-9-11 generation. And that's because the law that we're operating this program under has stipulations around relationships to the veteran. So we can't include those friends, those battle buddies who are serving as caregivers unless they live with the veteran. Um, and so you get sort of a feel for mostly women, mostly spouses, but we do have a, a growing number, a growing percentage of parents as well. Um, one of the key pieces of this particular program is that the caregiver must complete some training before they uh, can become approved for the program. So we've developed this in collaboration with Easter Seals. Most of our caregivers are taking that program online and includes topics really not on the specifics of the duties of caregiving, but sort of the role of the caregiver. So things like taking care of yourself, um, how to provide, uh, how to deal with some of the more difficult behaviors that you may come across with a veteran who has a traumatic brain injury or some other cognitive issues or a mental health issue. And also talking about resources and how to be an advocate. Those kinds of, of uh, trainings are very beneficial for caregivers and we get a lot of very positive feedback about this particular training program. We've actually trained more than 25,000 family caregivers to date, which is a huge marker for us and we're, we're thrilled about that. Um, one of the things that we're doing right now is we are very desperately working on program evaluation to make sure that this program is doing what it needs to be doing. It's a very expensive program. Um, our budget for this year is about $470 million. So we need to make sure that we're doing right by that funding. So we actually uh, had the Office of the Actuary take a look at 9,000 veterans who were participating in the program who had also been enrolled in VA healthcare prior to their participation. And our preliminary findings are very exciting. We actually see that once the veteran is enrolled in the program, they actually have a decrease of about 30% in their inpatient admissions. So really what I say to people is supporting the caregiver keeps the veteran out of the hospital. So this is something that we're very excited about and we hope to take a look at this um, with larger numbers of veterans participating in over a longer period of time. We are also involved in a longer term project with um, some researchers from the Durham VA to really look at the entire program. So we're going to look at the impact of the program on the health and well-being of veterans, but also on the health and well-being of caregivers through doing some survey. Um, we're also want to take a look at what 
parts of the program, as, as I mentioned, there are many different pieces. There's the stipend, there's education, there's respite, there's health care. So we want to see which of those components are valued by the caregivers and which are making the most impact so that we can continue to um, really offer what's working and, and think differently about what's not working. And really what we want to do eventually is get to a place where we have more of a cost-benefit analysis. That takes quite some time and a lot of data, so we're not there yet, but we're starting to lay the foundation of that particular uh, aspect of looking at program evaluation. And that's the end of what I was going to talk about. I'll turn it back over. Thank you. Thank you, Meg, so much for helping our members be familiar with what the VA offers. We appreciate it so much. Ladies, we do have a few minutes for questions. If Terry and Meg would join me up here. You're, you're it? Terry and Meg. Any questions for Terry or, oh, I see someone coming. Coming to the mic, would you please join yeah, me? Of course. Hi, Glennis Steely, Department of Nevada. Um, in relation to the caregiver's stipend that you were speaking of, is there an offset based on a veteran's disability rating? No, under the current program, there's no offset. Based so on they would get both amounts of money? Correct. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. There's also not an offset for aid and attendance, which I'm asked often about. So um, really it has nothing to do, because it's on the healthcare side of VA, it has nothing to do with the benefit side. Okay, thank you, because I am familiar with the aid and attendance. This is the first time I've ever heard of this program, which is another thing that I wanted to kind of mention briefly is you need to make sure nationwide more people are aware of all of those programs. Absolutely. I took care of my Absolutely. husband That's for two years and didn't know anything about this program. And a lot of the ladies in this room know I lost my husband a year ago. Three years ago, I could have really, really used this help. Thank you. Well, thank you. Great presentation, Tawana Mitchell, unit president in Maryland. Um, this presentation, could y'all upload that on the website so that we can get it, this valuable information? Thank you. Yes, it will be, ladies. It will be uploaded. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. This will be our last question. You, you have uh, concentrated on help for the caregiver as well as the, the care recipient. Uh, do you do anything with the extended families, the children, the parents, uh, the ex-wife, as it turns out in a, a many cases, uh, only because she can't handle it? In, some circumstances, because sometimes the caregiver gets so worn down because the rest of the family doesn't participate in the life and times of the uh, person receiving the care. It's uh, another body that they may or may not see once a year right. or send a Christmas card to. And do you, uh, do you uh, go into any kind of training for them as well and so that they recognize their responsibilities to uh, their uh, injured relative? So I can answer that in a couple of different ways. One thing is that many of our programs are available to uh, not necessarily just the spouse, um, but if there are uh, two parents involved or adult children or things like um, some of the online programs that I talked about, Building Better Caregivers, we actually, that program is, we have several folks who are a niece or nephew who may live a couple hours away but are doing a lot of case management over the phone and calling constantly. Some of them are, are participating in that Building Better Caregivers program. So many of our resources are available for others. There is a component in the core curriculum that I mentioned for the post 9-11 group that's specifically about dealing with families and getting your family to help and how to, how to receive that help and how to ask for that help and how to convince others to to chip in as well. So, um, and I think Terry can talk about, there are a lot of other resources out there to help families and, and children as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. As I mentioned, um, you know, we found 120 organizations that were providing some type of support or service or benefit to caregivers. Only one of them was the Department of Veterans Affairs. And so that's 119 other organizations, including the Department of Defense, as well as um, some other federal departments and those operating in the non-governmental sector. Um, there's a massive amount of information available about all of these places on our website. And so if you're interested, if you go to um, the www.ran.org backslash military hyphen caregivers, on that website you'll find um, a huge PDF file that lists all those 120 organizations with detailed information about exactly what types of services they provide and to whom. So many of them, in fact, do provide support services for the extended family, for others who may be interested in learning a little bit more about how to be a better caregiver or to get some of those resources. So again, it's www.rand.org backslash military hyphen caregivers, and it's, form, it's known as Appendix H, um, and it's a very um, thick PDF document with detailed on those organizations. Thank you so much. Can I just give the website one sure. more time? It will be yeah. on the website. rand.org backslash military hyphen caregivers. And that links to all of our information, as well as additional files that you can download about um, the study's findings, recommendations, as well as the organizations that we included. You're welcome. Terry and Meg, thank you so much for sharing part of your day with us and sharing such valuable information. Okay. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Linda Davis. Linda's Executive Vice President of the Tragedy Assistant Program for Survivors. She is nationally recognized leader in the development and implementation of programs that support the quality of life for military personnel, veterans, their families, caregivers, and survivors. Linda served as Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Military Community and Family Policy Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy and led the first Joint Department of Defense and Department of Veterans Affairs comprehensive care and case management reform in support for wounded warriors. Her team created the National Resource Directory and Recovery Care Plans, which assist in medical and behavioral service delivery from rehabilitation to community reintegration. Linda is a former Army officer and VA clinician. She is also a legionnaire. I have heard that Linda is one of the busiest veteran advocates in the nation's capital, and that in addition to her staff position with TAPS, she serves on boards and advisory committees of several other military and veterans groups. And it is one of those capacities that Linda has joined us today. Dr. Davis is leading the development of the Military and Veteran Caregiver Peer Support Network one of the Dole Foundation's caregiver support initiatives. We have invited Linda to introduce us to this forthcoming initiative. Pay special attention because this is the Dole Foundation initiative to which the American Legion Auxiliary will be most closely affiliate, affiliated. Please welcome Linda. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here and uh, among my fellow legionnaires and auxiliary members um, and some caregivers. In the back, I couldn't exactly see how many hands went up when Meg asked about how many of you are caregivers now, but if you're not already, um, it's very likely you will be. Um, I had the honor to be a caregiver to my father um, who was uh, served in World War II at the end of his life. VA gave the best end of life care, some of the best you will get anywhere. And I'm very grateful for that. I was the caregiver of my military spouse husband and um, uh, know what it is to lose somebody you love very dearly after caring for them for some time. Um, I thank the American Legion Auxiliary for stepping up to the plate and volunteering to be a very active uh, leader partner in this new effort that um, we are creating to support caregivers of all eras, of all relationships, 
based on the need of the RAND Foundation finding that Terry alluded to, and that is that there is an increase in isolation among both pre and post 9-11 caregivers, particularly the post 9-11, and that that sense of isolation, of not knowing where to turn, of not having someone to talk to, of not having a sense that somebody understands, of not being able to call somebody for help that is uh, responsive and the right kind of help at the right time, that that creates increased sense of uh, isolation and depression and physical challenges to the caregiver. Um, we wanted to address that by modeling a peer system nationwide of peer support for the caregiver based on the successful experience that the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors had had supporting those loved ones who uh, had a military member die. It taps, they have evidence over 20 years that shows that peer support is an extremely helpful way for addressing things like feelings of connectedness, how to get engaged after a loss, how to have hope and how to have a sense of healing, how to increase your knowledge and how to increase your skills. We want those same things to be there for our military and veteran caregivers. So we're duplicating that program with the help of many military and veteran service organizations, including, thankfully, the American Legion Auxiliary. You all will be one of our lead partners in one of our key programs that we'll be creating and launching starting in May when the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, which I sit on the board of, and the White House announced this major uh, effort. We are creating three programs specifically as part of our comprehensive outreach nationwide to military and veteran caregivers. We have a peer support program. I, Under the little box that says program services, we have the peer mentor program. We have a online community peer support program. And we will have a community-based peer support groups. All of these will be run by and for and about caregivers that have been trained and qualified for the roles they will assume as either a mentor a moderator of a community-based group online, a chat. Uh, they will also uh, be trained as facilitators for the community groups. The community groups may be held in a faith-based organization who are our partners. They may also be held in American Legion Post. Um, that's up to the community that has the uh, interest and willingness to reach out and to serve the caregivers in the community. Um, one of the things we will do is address the, um, some of the items that Terry mentioned about the importance of having sustainability and accountability. We have a very robust uh, way of evaluating all the services we're gonna be providing. And to building capacity in the community uh, groups that we associate with, um, but another key thing we've heard from caregivers is that um, whether they're meeting together in a community group or whether they're talking online, they want to make sure that they're secure and that what they're saying is confidential. You've all heard recently in the news about the threats that military families feel uh, towards them and especially if there's children in the family. And this is not just on our installations, but since in the community, some have no longer using their Facebooks. Be, uh, their um, face, what is it called? Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> I'm not gonna run that particular program, I promise. Um, 
I use it all the time, uh, our, our Facebooks, because they feel like they're, um, that they're vulnerable and that people could break in. Well, one of the things we're glad to do is that we will be able to build a national secure platform. Um, so I don't want to go into details, but I do want to tell you that um, because of the contributions of members like yourselves and your organization, that we will be able to serve in our first year 50,000 caregivers with everything from peer mentors to access to the kinds of webinars that Meg mentioned, educating caregivers to their roles, to community-based support groups that will include things like child care and respite care for them. It will include community outreach and connection to groups like the faith-based organizations that our caregivers rely on that was already mentioned. Um, we will be recruiting from the American Legion Auxiliary. Uh, those individuals like yourselves who perhaps have already served in this role and right now you might have some time to volunteer as a peer mentor you might have some time to volunteer in coordinating, organizing, or even moderating a community support group in your neighborhood. You might have something that you have found that is very valuable to you and you would like to share that and we can create a webinar with you. So the possibilities are endless, but we have heard the crying need of the 5.5 million caregivers of our military and veterans and we need to make sure they're supported. And as was mentioned, sometimes those caring for this military or veteran service member, largely the veteran, they themselves were not around when the person served in the military. They don't have the military culture background. My sister-in-law is caring for my brother-in-law and they were together, came together 30 years ago but after his military experience. He's now hospitalized at the VA, and she had no idea until this weekend when I was able to talk to her again and impress upon her the importance of reaching out to the local organizations that are there in her community to support her. She feels alone. She's estranged from the military culture and the veteran culture. She didn't have any idea. We want to support people like that because she's supporting our heroes who served just like you all are every single day. So I thank you so much and your leadership for your willingness to be part of our team. And we look forward next year to reporting out the great things that the American Legion Auxiliary is doing in our caregiver network. Thank you. Linda, thank you for mapping out the forthcoming military and veteran caregiver peer support network. And truly, thank you for all that you're doing in your free time to get the network built. If you'd please stay on stage uh, to help field some questions just a little bit later. Right there's fine. You're good, you're good, right there. Have a, have a seat. <laughs> I'll call you up in just a little bit. Ladies, my perspective on this forthcoming new Veterans Affairs and Rehabilitation Volunteer Opportunity is that it perfectly aligns with our membership and our mission. After all, how many of us have served as caregivers for our World War II or Korean mothers, dads, aunts, uncles, our Vietnam War husbands, sisters, and brothers, and our Iraq and Afghanistan sons and daughters, we know caregiving because we do it. I expect that over the next few years, this will become one more of the major areas of the ALA members in which ALA members are serving on par with our national volunteer commitment to the VA Voluntary Service, to veterans' creative arts, and to veterans' homelessness. So let me address some of the practicalities. First, 
the support system for the military and veteran caregiver support network that Linda Davis has just described is still being constructed. So we aren't open for business yet, but we expect to be fully open by fall 2015. Second, the military and veteran caregiver support network isn't being constructed just for the auxiliary, but for other organizations that will also be participating. And so that affects the launch timeline. Linda and her team want to be sure that the system works, that they build works for all. Now, once a caregiver support network system launches, the American Legion Auxiliary will be issuing a call to action for our members. We will be requesting our members to consider either both either or both of two caregiver support network volunteer opportunities. Our greatest need will be to recruit members willing to serve as caregivers peer supporters. For these assignments, we want members who have some experience, either past or current, providing care to a service member or veteran. These volunteers will be matched to someone currently providing care to a service member or veteran. They will be expected to form a one-to-one -on, one -one relationship with their assigned caregiver. The relationships may be maintained in person, by telephone, by email, or a combination thereof. The expectation is that volunteers and caregivers will provide friendly advice, tips, a shoulder to cry on, or other emotional support. Volunteers will not only ex be expected to provide practical services to the caregiver or their veteran. I think this is going to be a golden opportunity for those of our members who desire close connection with other military or veteran family and those who desire flexibility in scheduling their volunteer time. Our initial target is 500 caregiver support, peer supporters, certainly achievable among our membership of 800,000, don't you think? Yes. I think so too. A second volunteer type we will be recruiting is caregiver support team leaders. Each team leader will serve as a recruitment, training, and administrative helper to a group of caregiver peer supporters. We would like 20 to 25 such volunteers at the start. Today, we are just introducing you to the future opportunities. As caregiver peer support network takes more shape, more specifics will clear up, including the content and method of delivering startup organ, uh, organ orientation to volunteers, instructions for tracking and reporting service hours, and other such details. Don't worry, Linda and her team at TAPS are really familiar with how peer support networks operate as they manage such networks for survivor families and have been doing so for several years. And so they are pulling from that experience the best practices that make sense to apply to the caregiver context. I will conclude a twofold request. First, reflect whether volunteering as a caregiver peer supporter or peer supporter team leader might be a good match for you. And second, begin to talk up this forthcoming volunteer opportunity with your auxiliary friends. Stay tuned for an announcement by the auxiliary when the military and veteran caregiver peer support system is operational and open for business. I'm excited and I can't wait to see our auxiliary members respond in force to this new volunteer opportunity. Other military and veteran groups are looking to us to lead in this area. Let's show them that they are right to trust us to deliver on service, not self. So 
Linda, if you would please join me for a Davis and Davis Q&A. <laughs> uh, <Exactly. laughs> let's see if there's any quick questions that Linda or I can answer at this time. If you'd please come to the center mic. Got one. It always takes that first one. If you can't, you can't volunteer. <laughs> is the American, oh, Judy Tweet from the Department of North Dakota, is the American Legion involved in this? There are not only auxiliary members taking care of spouses, but there could be women taking care of, or uh, legionnaires taking care of um, their spouse. It, are the Legion going to uh, pick up the ball in this also? Absolutely, the um, Legion will be one of the more than 1,000 military and veteran service organizations around the country that we expect to be involved in one of the many, the three programs and the other services. However, we have a small handful, less than 10, of core um, nonprofit and membership associations that we specifically asked to join us as our team leads. And it was ALA we went to, not to the Legion. But they will not be excluded. Next. Um, hi, Bob Reed. You all know me. Hello. Um, hi, Bob. My I very wanna, best, my best I wanna, friend. I want to make sure. I, it occurred to me we hadn't emphasized this enough. We're looking for you all to mobilize our 800,000 members to find this as a volunteer opportunity, but also consider it as a caregiver support opportunity, whether it's you in the room, women in your unit lives, other people in your community. They need this help too. So while we're recruiting, or will be recruiting volunteers, we're also wanting to build the network of people who need that caregiver support. So you might be thinking, oh my God, I'm overwhelmed. I can't do this. I'm in that role as a caregiver. You might be a great candidate to be a beneficiary of the service. So we need to think of this both ways and we'll be serving our membership fully that way. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for everything. So before I tell you we're going to take a recess, um, I'd like all those participating in the Parade of Checks to line up in the President's Hallway stage left, and you now may take a five-minute recess. Five minutes. <laughs>